Good afternoon and welcome to this discussion on Turkey's post-pandemic trajectory, Turkey's uh, domestic uh, economics and politics and its foreign policy have increasingly shown signs of complexity, shall we say, and um, we are here today to try to disentangle and understand um, some potential um, developments um, after the pandemic. Uh, we are joined by three uh, of our Carnegie scholars. Um, Sinan Ulgan is our scholar uh, based in Istanbul most of the time. Uh, Marc Pierini, a uh, scholar for Carnegie Europe based in Brussels, and Dmitry Trenin, who is the director of the Carnegie Moscow Center. Um, this will allow us to look both at what's happening inside Turkey and how things could evolve uh, over time. It would also allow us to look at the relationship, Turkey's foreign policy and the relationship with the EU, NATO, um, the US, but also to focus a bit on the relationship between Turkey and Russia, um, which has been growing um, over the years, uh, but the two actors uh, are also often at odds. So uh, there are lots of question marks as to where that relationship uh, will be going. I um, will start with uh, Sinan Ulgan. Uh, Sinan, the floor is yours. Um, give us a bit of a, an insight into what is happening in Turkey at the moment and how the coronavirus is playing out um, on the health front, but also on the political and on the economic front. As we know, Turkey was in a pretty dire situation economically and financially ahead of uh, the coronavirus. So how is that playing out in domestic politics at the moment? Thank you, Rosa. Let me start with the health situation, and I'll be very short about that. Uh, but in essence, uh, there are two dimensions of uh, the health uh, shock, where the performance of the government has been, in a way, diametrically opposite. The first dimension is about the spread of the virus. There, the performance, uh, when we look at the numbers, uh, have not been that great. Uh, we, in Turkey, there are now about 130,000 uh, registered cases. Uh, that's obviously quite a number. Uh, every day we see between 150, uh, 1,500 and 2,000 new cases. So it keeps growing. Uh, in that sense, the government uh, has not uh, gone uh, the route of some of European countries which have Im imposed very strict lockdown measures. Uh, in Turkey, uh, the lockdown is a bit more haphazard, uh, where there is, you know, lockdown over the weekend, but during the week, people are relatively free to move. Uh, so that's on how, you know, about the spread of the virus. However, uh, the government has been uh, relatively quite successful in the treatment phase of the virus. So when you look again at the, you know, the, the fatality rates, uh, Turkey fatality, Turkish fatality ra rates are even lower than Germany. And uh, this is uh, in essence due to a combination of factors. One, uh, Turkey has a strong health system infrastructure, uh, both on the, you know, uh, the, the physical infrastructure, but also the human resources. Uh, that's a strong point uh, of, uh, of, of Turkey as a whole. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, there is quasi-universal health coverage, uh, like in many European countries as well. So Turks can go freely uh, and get treatment in whichever hospital they want to. Uh, so in that sense, the treatment phase of the, of the virus has been uh, relatively quite, uh, quite successful. So that's the, in a way, the, the mitigated picture that we have on the, on the health side. Of course, nowadays, the Turkish government, uh, like many other governments in Europe, is, is thinking about how to relax some of these measures, because obviously these measures have had uh, a, an immense impact uh, on, on the economy. Uh, the, uh, and this is the, the key vulnerability now facing Turkey, and it will remain the key vulnerability facing the country going forward. Because already, as you pointed out in your initial remarks, uh, the economy was already vulnerable before being hit by this external shock. Uh, and now we see uh, all, the, all, this, uh, all, all the damage. We see it on many fronts. Uh, one, uh, the pressure building up on the domestic currency, where uh, the, uh, the, there has been a fast depreciation of the Turkish lira. 
which has uh, led uh, to uh, basically uh, also the central bank uh, trying to protect the Turkish lira mm -hmm. uh, and depleting uh, the foreign exchange reserves. So that's that's one dimension. But the other dimension is that the stimulus package disclosed by the government, announced by the government, is relatively smaller compared to many other European countries, which means that uh, there are not enough domestic resources uh, to help with the recovery phase of, uh, of the shock. So, and therefore we may end up with higher unemployment numbers than uh, in many other places in the rest of Europe. Uh, with you know people uh, not only unemployed but also uh, a, a scaling down a reduction of their of their revenues uh, because the government has few resources really to to back them up uh, with uh, direct uh, income support so uh, that is the you know that is going to be uh, the main challenge of the country and it, it is going to have an influence on the politics but also on the foreign policy of the country in the months and possibly years to come. Uh, this is as big as economic shock of, as any uh, that we have witnessed uh, in recent memory. Uh, and uh, that is why I think the, uh, the, uh, the impact will be uh, consequential. Now on the, on the political side of few words, uh, uh, this you know, by extension or by extrapolation, I think that the, uh, the dynamics of the Turkish political landscape will be determined by how successful the government is in addressing and tackling this big economic shock. Uh, so that, that, you know, in a few words, that's really going to uh, port the, uh, determine uh, the outcome uh, and of uh, Turkish uh, political contest. What we see in the short run is uh, a bit like what we've seen in other countries. There is a rally around, around the leader phenomenon. So the early poll numbers do suggest that there has, there's a bump uh, in the popularity of the church leadership, the pres President Erdogan. But that's uh, a bit like you know, what we witness in the rest of the world, and including Trump, including the European leaders, Merkel and Macron too. Uh, and that's to be expected in times of this type of acute crisis uh, people tend to uh, aggregate around uh, their current leader. But obviously this is not a permanent phenomenon uh, given the size of the economic challenge. Uh, but uh, as things stand, this is you know, the, political, uh, the political outcome in the short term. The second perhaps uh, political outcome uh, that I think needs to be underlined uh, is uh, the now the sort of contest between uh, local leaders and uh, the uh, and the government, and here in particular, I want to refer uh, to uh, the emergence of uh, a leadership both in Istanbul, uh, Imamoğlu, the winner of last year's local elections, but also in Ankara, Mansur Yavaş. Uh, who have done uh, a, a relatively good job in uh, launching new social programs, have raised their profile nationally, uh, and uh, are, are being recognized as such. So uh, they are, uh, in that sense, uh, in, a in, a, in a race of popularity uh, with the central government, as a result of which uh, the government has tried to impede uh, some of these efforts by uh, the local uh, municipalities, uh, incl including you know, the donation campaigns that they've started. So we see already, uh, if you want, uh, some um, colors of the type of political race that can emerge uh, in, the, in the medium term in Turkey. Uh, between these, you know, local leaders, whether it's Imamoğlu or Mansur Yavaş, uh, and uh, and uh, the Turkish president, so that's really been the second political uh, impact. The third one is that uh, because of the uh, difficulty of the health uh, or the enormity of the health challenge initially, uh, we can't even talk about any sort of normal political uh, space. Uh, it's, it's really been about, you know, the shock treatment uh, on the health side. And that's been a handicap for some of the newcomers on the political scene, 
including the former economics minister Ali Babacan and the former foreign affairs minister Davutoğlu, who recently uh, launched their own political initiatives. But right now, there is really no scope for them uh, to become visible because there is no normal politics. Uh, and therefore, uh, you, their impact on the overall political landscape still uh, remains to be determined. Finally, on foreign policy, all these challenges are also affecting uh, Turkey's uh, direction in foreign policy. But perhaps uh, I may want to stop here. I'd certainly be happy for a second round and, and, and turn the floor to Mark and Dimitri. Thank you very much, uh, Sinan. And I'm sure we'll be going back to some issues, but I would like to bring Mark in. But before I do that, um, I'd just like to encourage um, our listeners, uh, our audience, if they want to ask any questions, do you can start sending questions now uh, through the YouTube channel and the Twitter channels and email. Um, so that in the second half of this discussion, we can, we hope to be able to answer some of your um, questions. Mark, uh, Sinan pointed out how the uh, domestic economic uh, situation has implications on its uh, foreign policy. And of course, there's several, uh, from Turkey's foreign policy at the moment has several layers and several uh, multiple conflicting relationships. But one of the most important one remains that with the EU, especially on the economic front. Um, how do you see things evolving in that sense? Thank you, Rosa. Well, I'd say that seen from Brussels, um, Berlin or Paris or even London, um, uh, the, the pandemic uh, is in Turkey acting like in many other countries worldwide. It's like a, a countrywide X-ray, uh, revealing all these pre-existing flows that you had in the political domain, the, the political domain, the economic or the foreign policy domain. And uh, in the case of, of uh, Turkey, we've seen uh, quite a lot of wrong-footed uh, economic and monetary choices, especially with interest rates, with the refusal to be dealing with the IMF. And we've seen these past few days a tremendous um, fall in the uh, Turkish lira. And now, on top of this, which was already there before uh, the pandemic, you have a giant economic recession coming worldwide, especially acute for the European countries. And European countries, of course, are the uh, market for Turkish exports. They are the source of technology uh, for Turkey and are the source of short-term capital and foreign direct investment in majority. So the, the backlash of the pandemic on the European zone will have a direct effect on Turkey, but on a Turkey where the choices were, were uh, the wrong ones, economically speaking. On top of that, uh, what you have is, is a situation where, where has the EU is the economic anchor of Turkey and there is very, very little alternative except Russia for energy together with Iran and Russia again for uh, defense now. Uh, but other than that, capital technology exports, it's always uh, Europe or majority is with Europe. At the same time, Turkey has recently, let's say in 2017 and, and onwards, including uh, last month, uh, treated the EU as the adversary of choice. You know, uh, there, there are things that may be forgotten quickly in, in this uh, focus that we have now on COVID-19, but in late February, early March, you had the Turkish government, the Ministry of Interior, organizing an assault on the Greek border, on the land border with Greece, which is very short. Um, and um, it ended up in failure, of course, but it ended up in Turkey again, using a Nazi narrative against the Greeks. Well, today we are the 8th of May, and this is the uh, anniversary of the end of World War II. And, and we all know how sensitive in the EU the, the references to Nazis, uh, you know, Nazi remnants, uh, Nazi behavior, this sort of thing were used in March and September 2017, were used again uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, this doesn't create an atmosphere where Turkey and uh, Turkish and EU leaders can easily uh, talk. And when they talk, it's rather difficult. It happened in early March. The president of Turkey went to Brussels, met with Charles Michel and Ursula von der Leyen, 
um, but the discussion was so tense that he left before the joint press conference. Uh, so that's where we stand now. Plus, of course, gas drilling around the island of Cyprus, changing the maritime boundaries and so on and so forth. Now, if we look at Turkish policies, and, and again, focus on, on the economic side, uh, we see that the choice has been autocracy, no free press, no independent judiciary, no independent central bank, no vibrant civil society, scandalous uh, treatment of people like Osman Kavala, a lot of yes men around the president, or a few yes men plus one son-in-law, none of this creates credibility on the international markets. And you can pump a narrative on the Turkish press about conspiracies and so on, which was done again yesterday about the uh, exchange rate. Uh, this has zero credibility. So we have a country which has a lot of potential, which is highly dependent on the outside world for finance, exports, and technology, and is not putting together the policies that, that are needed. So Turkey, in a, in a nutshell, is paying a heavy price for a one-man rule system. The one-man rule system, of course, has, in, in my view, uh, a justification, which is that the presidential party, the AKP, has lost its monopoly. It's now in a deal with the Nationalist Party, MHP, and that's a very difficult uh, alliance. Uh, and that is, of course, bearing on the uh, policies that are followed. One word uh, or two on, on the foreign uh, policy and security scene. Uh, I'll leave aside Syria and Libya, where the choices are not easily comprehensible, but uh, focus on NATO. Uh, for the past uh, few years, uh, Turkey has been in a deal with Russia. Now, Russian S-400 missiles are uh, deployed with Russian personnel. They're not active, uh, we're told. This will uh, probably trigger US sanctions. but. Seen from Brussels, which of course is not only the EU but the headquarters of NATO, um, basically what the judgment in NATO is uh, is simply Turkey has sided for its own reasons with uh, Russia, and this is disruptive of NATO. If you prefer, uh, I'll say it a different way: the NATO missile defense architecture is now, you know, in in tatters because of the Russian deployment. And this is the first time you have uh, an active deployment of a sophisticated type of missile on a, a NATO country where you, of course, also have NATO assets and weaponry and radars and so on deployed. So that is something very, very big. All of these uh, uh, tensions that I'm mentioning were predating the pandemic, obviously. They're sort of on the on the parking lot, if you want. There, there is a, a COVID-induced lull in all these things. Nobody is actively discussing with Turkey maritime boundaries, although this is a huge subject. Nobody is actively talking about uh, refugees at the moment or uh, the maritime boundaries and the agreement, the so-called agreement with with Libya. But these issues are not going to be solved by the pandemic. They're going to come back. Uh, and, and there you have a sort of Gordian knot, if you want. You, you have choices that go in the direction of political survival uh, and that are totally opposite what you need for economic salvation, let alone a good relationship with the EU. So we just don't know. This is a huge uncertainty. We don't know where this is going. Or maybe it's not going anywhere. And the choice in Ankara is permanent tension because this, you know, for the next three years until the next presidential election might be uh, seen in Ankara as the best tactics. Thank you very, thank you very much, Mark. Um, quite a few points I'd like to return to, but uh, before I'd like to pass the floor to Dimitri Trenin. Uh, a few years ago, I think many thought the uh, Russian-Turkish um, relationship was opportunistic, but um, uh, given that it's still holding, maybe the shared interests of sowing discord in the West are 
um, more important than the differences that do exist um, uh, between Russia and Turkey, which we've seen in Libya and also in Syria. So what, what is it seen from Moscow? What is it that drives this relationship in your view, Dimitri? Well, first of all, thank you very much, Rosa. Um, thank you for this question. It's, it's a privilege to be on the panel with, uh, with you and my colleagues. Um, I think that the Turkish-Russian relationship um, is a realist paradise. It's squarely based on uh, interests. Uh, there are no ties that uh, bound the two countries, that bind the two countries too closely together. Each can pursue its course. And uh, at the end of the day, they manage to figure out uh, their differences if they can, or they uh, agree to disagree. I think it's also a relationship that uh, bears uh, very heavy baggage from history, mostly on the Turkish side from the 12 or, or so wars that the two countries have fought over a couple of centuries. But right now, the interests intersect uh, in a number of areas where that you alluded, uh, you alluded to that. And uh, I think that this um, overlap is, uh, is likely to last for, for some time. It doesn't, um, it doesn't guarantee that uh, there are no difficulties. In fact, there are clashes uh, once in a while. And um, if you like, the relationship uh, goes from an, a quasi-alliance uh, relationship in, in some cases to essentially a quasi-hostile relationship, uh, a, a direct military clash between Russian and Turkish forces is, uh, is never to be absolutely ruled out. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and this is, this is a relationship, as I said, uh, that's essentially non-institutionalized. It requires the two top leaders to, uh, to uh, exercise stewardship and uh, uh, often they need to be uh, personally involved to solve uh, the problems that that exist. From the Russian standpoint, it's a useful relationship. Russia recognizes Turkey as a uh, as a major uh, regional power in the Middle East, and um, specifically, Russia needs uh, some kind of collaboration with Turkey in uh, Syria. It also needs it now in Libya. But uh, in, in some respect, even more broadly in the Middle East. But in both Syria and Libya, as we know, there are, there are differences, and uh, those differences uh, can lead to potentially can lead to clashes. Uh, I want to highlight something that uh, I don't think is uh, is is very well understood. Uh, there is no Russia orbit for Turkey to uh, to go to. Russia has no orbit, really, not, not an orbit to speak of. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no Russian camp. Russia is not uh, an alternative, not a strategic alternative to Turkey. Uh, as, as I see it, Turkey's outreach to Russia is an expression of the Turkish leadership's wish to be um, a regional power in its own right. And for that, you need a fairly wide degree of uh, diversification of your policies. In fact, uh, uh, maintaining a relationship with Russia, a fairly close relationship on, in, in some cases, in, in some fields, is a sign of Turkey's, um, uh, let's say, autonomy, if not independence, vis-a-vis -vis its allies in NATO, vis-a-vis -vis its uh, principal ally in the United States. And that, that is uh, something that feeds into, into Turkey, um, at least the Turkish leadership's uh, self-image. And uh, very lastly, I think that the S-400 thing, well, of course, uh, no one can, can tell what was uh, the, uh, the actual purpose of uh, Turkey purchasing those systems. And that was a decision made by the president personally. But in my view, again, what do I know? I think that uh, the fact that those systems are not and cannot be integrated 
into the um, air defense system in Turkey, NATO air defense system in Turkey, is mm -hmm. uh, more of an asset. In act it's actually an asset rather than a drawback. Because I don't think that the principal uh, purpose of uh, purchasing those missiles was to shore up Turkey's uh, air defenses against an external enemy. It's more likely that uh, uh, President Erdogan has been thinking about the uh, 2016 coup attempt when Turkish Air Force planes attacked his residence. And uh, NATO's role in that uh, coup attempt is, uh, is something that uh, is not completely clear, at least to me. So uh, if you can protect yourself and only yourself, with uh, the help of those systems that are not integrated with NATO, that may be your personal. That may go toward your personal. I will stop here. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we have quite a few questions actually coming in, and I think we, I think I can give at least one to each of you. So um, I'm going to read all of them at the moment. The three, the first three questions at least that have come in. Uh, so the first is on the economy from Emre Pekka. So this is for you, Sinan. Uh, do you anticipate capital controls and the lira sell-off and economic headwinds? Then we have a question which is much more, well, it's more political uh, from Emre Kisoglu. Uh, do you think that some of the Western partners are responsible because, so it's the responsibility of the West because they supported the advocate of political Islam in Turkey and now Turkey is drifting apart from the Western values um, which are mostly which are mostly part of universal values. Then I have a question from Amanda Sloat. How do you see Turkey's balancing act vis-a-vis -vis US and Russia? And how do you see Erdogan's approach to the US? A big charm offensive with uh, Mead aid, the delay on the S-400. Um, and indeed, uh, I also wanted to um, ask about how do you interpret the S-400 um, question, has Turkey changed its mind? So this is maybe for both Sinan and Mark, but also for Dimitri, how is that seen in Moscow at the moment? So we have quite a lot of, um, quite a lot of issues to discuss. So shall we start Sinan with you on the economy and then maybe if you'd like to comment um, on the drift between, you, uh, between Turkey and the West and the reasons for it. Yes, I'll take up Emre's and Amanda's questions. Um, I'm glad that they are on this call. Um, so um, with regard to Emre's question, his first question was about capital controls, but more generally about where Turkey is heading economically. What I read from the government's uh, stance is that they are actually acutely aware of the challenges facing them. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, they are still not ready to do what, you know, would be the normal policy prescription, which is to go to the IMF. Uh, a country would go to the IMF for two reasons. Uh, the first reason would be to get, you know, a sizable loan to do structural reforms. This is what Turkey did in 2000-2001. Uh, and uh, the second reason uh, would be uh, to seek IMF assistance on a much smaller scale on the basis of the new instrument that was that the IMF has launched with the, designed to help countries mitigate the economic impact of the pandemic. So far, Turkey is refusing to do both. Now, I can understand why there is a, a rebuttal um, or a recalcitrance not to uh, go down the path of a big IMF package, uh, essentially because that would come with conditionality and currently uh, the direction, the governance of the country uh, is not, uh, that's not the direction of travel. So the IMF conditionality would come in, you know, with you know, boost strengthening regulatory institutions, introducing transparency in public procurement, uh, allowing the central bank to be independent. That's not necessarily uh, what we have seen in Turkey in the past few years, especially since the transition to an executive presidential system, which is all about uh, over centralization of power. So uh, that, that is ultimately the reason why uh, the Turkish government may not be too receptive to that idea. 
but I still have difficulty in understanding why the government would not go to the IMF for the small package, given that it comes without conditions. The only condition is that it has to be spent uh, in order to mitigate the impact of the economic crisis. Now, now ostensibly there, Turkey would only get about you know, nine to $10 billion, but even that would be a relief given how scarce the resources have been uh, to give especially direct income support to Turkish citizens. Um, so now the government has uh, seemingly uh, sidelined the IMF option uh, for the time being. Uh, it's become a very politically toxic term in Turkey to even talk about the IMF. So right now they're actually seeking to get uh, at least some foreign exchange liquidity by uh, having swap agreements with a number of central banks and particularly the US Fed. Uh, now, that would allow Turkey to actually, you know, uh, relax some of its uh, foreign exchange uh, bottleneck. It wouldn't necessarily be a solution to uh, more public resources to be spent, but at least on the foreign exchange side, it might be a benefit. But even there, uh, it's an uphill battle because so far the message, the, you know, the, on, on, from the U.S. Fed perspective, there is not uh, much of an appetite to do that with Turkey. Uh, the reason being that the Fed has a, a number of its own criteria. One, has, one is about economic and financial stability uh, of the country concerned. The second one is about the independence of the central bank and so on. So Turkey, and, and thirdly, that the country concerned should be important from a financial perspective to the US, which means that it should actually hold uh, a significant number of uh, US Treasury bonds. Now, none of these are fulfilled by Turkey, and that's the reason why the US Fed uh, does not demonstrate much of an appetite uh, to have this deal with Turkey. And on top of that, uh, we may even have some you know, political obstacles to this. Uh, now, the US Fed's uh, decision-making may not be based on, those, uh, on the politics of it, but even the economic criteria does not seem to be fulfilled. But interestingly, you know, under these circumstances, the only thing that could potentially push the Fed to say yes to Turkey would be some sort of extreme pressure from the president himself. Now, U.S. Fed as an independent institution, I don't know whether, you know, that's, uh, th there is an antecedent for that. But nonetheless, that seems to be, you know, theoretically the only possibility as things stand for the U.S. to grant that swap arrangement to Turkey, to help Turkey in these dire circumstances. Now, I wrote about uh, the European Central Bank a week ago in, in foreign policy and arguing that the ECB should actually have uh, more of a role in these type of swap arrangements, at least with its neighborhood. Turkey could be one of the beneficiaries. So far, that's not the case. But nonetheless, that seems to be uh, the option now uh, that uh, the Turkish government is exploring uh, by and large. If it fails there, then I think the, you know, uh, there, the, there are then two options. Either uh, you have to raise interest rates to, uh, to essentially protect the, 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 the domestic currency. But if you don't want to do that, then uh, unfortunately you have to talk about some set of uh, capital controls. And I would argue that you know, this is not a black and white thing. There are already some forms of capital controls introduced in Turkey. Um, on Amanda's question, uh, relationship with the US and S400, I think this is, you know, this is a good way to introduce that topic as well, because as you know, uh, Turkey had uh, for, for a few months now stated that it would operationalize the S400 in, in April. Uh, even that terminology is a bit odd because uh, when we initially look at the CATSA regulations, there is no description of you know, a system being operationalized or not. Normally, it's, it spoke about a significant transaction, which already happened. But nonetheless, you know, again, the benevolence of the U.S. Uh, leaders um, has created a situation where so far Turkey has been safe from the implementation of CATSA sanctions, but they could have been triggered nonetheless if Turkey went ahead and operationalized the system. Uh, but the Turkish leadership uh, decided apparently not to uh, have this type of political tension with the United States at a time when the economy is so brittle. So what we hear from Ankara is that there has been a decision to postpone the operationalization of the system, a difficult word. Uh, 
Um, but this does not mean, on the contrary, that Turkey has uh, the, has uh, decided uh, for a reversal of policy. What we don't hear from Ankara is that uh, you know they're not going to sideline the S-400. The decision to uh, make it operational stands. It's just a matter of timing. And with this type of obviously policy, the hope is uh, essentially to buy time, uh, uh, perhaps until you know the the uh, the economy improves, or perhaps until U.S. elections. So this is, you know, in a way, temporizing uh, until we know who's going to be sitting at the White House in January uh, 2021. Uh, that's so there are no clear strategic redirection. It's just a matter of trying to, you know, mitigate um, the adverse uh, impact at a time when uh, the economy uh, is under uh, duress. Thank you very much, Sinan. And that partially also responds to another question that has come in about the US saying that Trump has tried to minimize US-Turkey tensions, but how would the Biden presidency change that? And maybe, um, per, uh, Mark, maybe you could um, take a look at this as well in your, in your answers. Okay, uh, well, I will first uh, answer the, the second question on, on whether the, the West yeah. or Europe would have a responsibility in, in the current political uh, dominance of an Islamist party in, in, in Turkey. Well, we have to remember that for the first 10 years of, of the AKP in power, so from the beginning of 2003 onwards for, for a decade, uh, Europe was looking at Turkey as a Muslim democratic party in charge. Okay. Um, and, and that was the way uh, the Turkish politicians, the AKP leadership, were, were presenting themselves. Uh, except that there were different political cultures behind uh, th th this dialogue. Uh, one is that Europeans expect trust and, and dialogue with, with the uh, opposite party. And, and maybe uh, it was the reality at the beginning, but it then evolved, uh, only showing uh, really in 2011 with the legislative elections and then when uh, the uh, then Prime Minister Erdogan became president in 2014, there was a gradual evolution towards uh, autocracy, not in one step, it was small steps on, over several years and, and therefore the trust has, has disappeared. I don't think uh, the uh, European leaders at least uh, take any responsibility there, they just, you know, believe uh, leaders that are involved in, of countries involved in the accession process they take them at, at their word and and surely today what took the, the political system that president Erdogan has put in place with great consistency from uh, april 2017 onwards is totally antinomic with uh, the principles of of the eu so that uh, has gone uh, completely uh, by the wayside uh, about Amanda's question, I want to come back on, on one thing. The coup was on 15th of July 2016, was over by the next morning, and three weeks later, President Erdogan was in St. Petersburg meeting with Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. uh, he was most probably talking about, as Dimitri alluded to, uh, is defense, is defense of the palace, and, and, and because there was a big scare during the coup, and, and the president himself was personally uh, targeted. So there was a personal motivation there. But if you go to the end of the negotiation, you see that Turkey has been equipped with a superbly oversized system, the S400, if you want to defend just the palace and one person. Okay, so uh, what has happened is leaving aside the technicalities, that Russia has used these personal requests from the Turkish president to undermine NATO. This is what you have. And it doesn't matter whether compatible, not compatible, hooked to the uh, computer system of NATO or not. The political fact is that for the first time ever since 1952, when Turkey joined NATO, you have a sophisticated radar system manned by Russians in Turkey, period. And that is upsetting uh, the NATO system. Um, 
I think uh, about the last question, whether a, a Biden presidency would change anything. Well, first of all, before we get there, uh, it is clear that President Trump has some sort of affinity with autocratic leaders around the world, not just Turkey. So he might use that. It's very difficult in the uh, US system, especially in an election year, to suddenly have the president meddle into the Fed decisions, for example, or uh, to uh, reverse the uh, exclusion of Turkey from uh, the F-35 industrial program, which is a huge loss for, for Turkey's aerospace industry, which is a very high quality segment of the industrial landscape. So uh, there's certainly a personal leaning on, uh, on the side of President Trump towards uh, President Erdogan, but the uh, possibilities of, of putting that in practice are relatively limited. Uh, when eventually uh, Biden is the president, uh, a number of things will uh, probably change, but there again, you cannot erase the fundamentals uh, that is the view of the intelligence community and, and the Pentagon. So the view will remain uh, rather constrained vis-a-vis uh, -vis Turkey, unless of course there are changes occurring in Turkey. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. So I think what you said points us, gives the cue to Dimitri, but I'd like to add another question to you, Dimitri, if I may. A question from Suat Kini Kliogu. Uh, would it be accurate to say that Moscow views Turkey as a junior partner, sharing its anti-hegemonic posture? And are relations asymmetrical or does Moscow view Turkey as an equal partner? So this, in addition to how Moscow responded to the delay in the activation of S-400. Well, I don't think that uh, Moscow deals with Turkey as a as a junior partner. I don't think that President Erdogan would uh, would actually allow uh, Russia to uh, take uh, that kind of attitude and accept that kind of attitude from Moscow. I don't I don't see it. Turkey is seen as as an important regional power, which has um, a very strong leader at this point who is uh, sometimes difficult to deal with, but on the other hand, he is uh, the one uh, to go to. So there's uh, just uh, one stop. It's a one stop show. You don't have to, uh, to uh, look after a, a wide array of players. Just, there's just one player that you uh, deal with. Um, Anti-hegemonical, I think that, that, that for the Russians, what, uh, uh, President Erdogan is doing is uh, essentially uh, claiming a position for Turkey that goes beyond um, being just uh, a loyal member of a U.S.-led alliance. And that goes uh, from the Russian standpoint that that agrees with the general trend in the world, which uh, leads to more players stepping onto the on, onto the front scene of global politics. Countries uh, do not uh, take uh, guidance from the world leader. Uh, they want to do things uh, based on their own interests, on their own worldviews. And Turkey is a prime example of that. In fact, uh, Russia itself has, uh, has gone down that path from the 1990s when it uh, essentially accepted U.S. leadership in the world, grudgingly, but it did. And then from the early 2000s, it uh, claimed back its position of an independent, sovereign, great power. Uh, well, you may say that Russia clearly understands the, the difference between, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the global weight of Russia and the global weight of Turkey are, are different, but you uh, can only have a relationship, a productive relationship with Turkey, if you deal with them as a as a co-equal. And uh, there's no sign that I can that I can spy from watching even the physical 
behavior of, of the two presidents that somehow Russia is uh, looking down on Turkey or seeing Turkey as uh, some kind of a junior partner. Russia does not have a junior partner in Ankara, clearly not. Sorry, forgot to unmute myself. I have a question which is directed uh, specifically to Mark, and I know Mark will like it, but I think Sinan might be interested as well. Um, the question is from Sinem Adar, SWP Berlin. Might the potential economic implications of the pandemic have also positive impacts, especially considering the discussion about the need to reorient supply chains from China to regions that are physically closer to Europe? And could Turkey be such option for the EU? So I'm asking, I'm, this is for Mark, but I know that Sinan will want to answer. So please, both of you, if you could answer, if you could address this. Yeah. And then I have a question, which might be the final question for all of you. Okay, well, uh, first of all, before I answer uh, Sinem's question, uh, one uh, additional word for, for Suet. Uh, the interesting element is that starting at the end of this year, or early next year, uh, and, and it has started in a, in a way already, uh, Turkish military power or the ability to project power outside uh, the boundaries of Turkey will be substantially increased. You have already armed drones that are pretty efficient and more are coming, more sophisticated, heavy loads. Uh, you have an helicopter carrier coming on stream with Spanish technology in a few months. You have six submarines being produced with German technology, one every year, so for the next six years. And, and you have a new generation of frigates in the Turkish Navy with uh, cruise missiles. So that will be a game changer. Turkey today is not a naval power in the Mediterranean in a very big way, but it will become a naval power. And it will be able, despite some limitations like not having the F-35B, the, the, the new airplane that could be used on the uh, helicopter carrier, uh, but it will become a much bigger power. And that in the current attitude of Turkey with maritime boundaries, with gas drilling, with refugees and so on, that could bring more tensions with at least Europe, but probably also with uh, the US and with Israel. Now, uh, turning to Sinan's question. Yes, in theory, you are absolutely right. If there is one first lesson to be drawn in the EU uh, about uh, this pandemic is that every single government was caught by surprise. And not only they had no stocks or very little stocks of masks and protective equipment and so on, or ventilators, but also they realized that the vast majority of the key ingredient for medical supplies, like morphine or cura or, or paracetamol or whatever, uh, are coming from China, number one, and from India, number two, and if not, from the US. Uh, so that is, is sort of a wake-up call. Uh, the citizens in all, all across Europe, including in the countries that are better off, like Germany, are very upset by this situation. And you're going to have a sort of repatriation of the production of some of these ingredients or equipments and the constitution of uh, EU stocks about it. It's not going to be the dismantling of globalization, of course not, but it is going to be some sort of uh, uh, repatriation. In that sense, the neighboring countries from let's say Morocco, Tunisia, Turkey, or, or uh, Ukraine, for example, have, or Western Balkans, of course, have a role to play. And Turkey is certainly, industrially speaking, the best place of, of them all uh, because of the size of its industry, because of the sophistication of its industry, and because of the capability to quickly shift production from one type of item to, to the other, which is probably a higher flexibility than anywhere in, in the EU. Problem with it is that although this sounds pretty natural, what you need is trust, confidence, dialogue between the political leaders in the EU and Turkey, and that you don't have at the moment. You, you cannot tell your citizens, 
from Berlin, from Brussels, from Paris, or what? Look, we've made big mistakes. We've trusted China too much. We're going to now it's we're going to trust Turkey when at the same time you have a conflict on missile defense and a Nazi narrative on the part of the leadership. So at one point you have to decide, and this is what I call the Grotten law. Thank you. Sinan, would you like to add to this? You also published a piece in Foreign Policy this uh, last week, a few days ago, uh, precisely on, uh, on, the, on the European neighbourhood. Maybe you'd like to say a few words as well? Uh, yes, then uh, let me start with uh, Sinan's question that uh, Mark answered. I think there's also a new question by Alper Joshkun, who also raises the issue that, you know, at a time when China is vilified, could that provide an opportunity for Turkey and the EU, at least economically and on the supply chains? Theoretically, yes. Uh, and I've been reading and myself uh, have been, you know, in a way reiterating uh, that proposition that, you know, one of the ways that this pandemic will affect uh, globalization is for multinational companies, particularly to review uh, their uh, supply chains uh, and possibly uh, revert uh, to a more resilient supply chain, which means that they will invest and at least diversify the, their investments away from China, even though China will remain as a, uh, as a hub. Uh, that I don't think will change. And that you know, theoretically provides an opportunity, at least for European companies, to consider Turkey as an alternative for some of these investments. There are two caveats though to this uh, proposition. The first caveat is that we don't actually know how big that trend is going to be. I mean, we can say that it's gonna be the case for you know, medical supplies, perhaps for some of the chemicals, but how big this is going to be in which sectors we shall see this trend of diversification away from China is still an open question. Secondly, uh, uh, as far as Turkey is concerned, Turkey cannot just sit and wait uh, because there's you know, the, the, always the possibility that these investments will fly over Turkey and end up in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. That's always you know, a possibility uh, given that the, most of these countries are EU members too. So I think Turkey has to be more proactive and here meaning proactive uh, means tackling some of the problems uh, that we have seen surfacing in terms of the investment climate in Turkey. And this is something that is you know, quite factual because uh, when we look at periods when Turkey was able to capture foreign investment, this is before the 2008 crisis, Turkey did get about $20 billion a year of foreign investment. That's about close to 1% of FDI flows globally. And that, is, that indeed corresponds also to Turkey's share in total population, you know, world income, which is also around 1%. Today, Turkey receives about 0.4% of global FDI outflows. Uh, last year, it was about $6 billion. So it's a country that used to receive 20 billion, now it's down to six. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is, uh, in essence has to do with fundamental freedoms, with the rule of law, with governance, with transparency, and so on. So uh, it, it, theoretically, yes, Turkey could take advantage of this trend, but it cannot. It, it also has to do something on its own in order to tackle uh, these uh, structural uh, these structural problems. Um, and, and, and finally, I, I did indeed, uh, you know, write an op-ed for foreign policy where I argued that. EU itself should be now pro more proactive now to help its neighborhood because we talked a lot about Turkey, but some of the uh, analysis can be extrapolated to many other countries uh, around Europe's neighborhood. The, in essence, uh, the size of the economic shock uh, is, uh, it does feel the same uh, wherever you go on Europe's neighborhood the type of you know, unemployment crisis that will emerge, the pressure on, on fiscal balances, the pressure on foreign exchange, on balance of payments. That's quite familiar to many other countries too. So my argument was that the, the EU should actually uh, take this into consideration. It is 
normal to expect that you know the EU would be introverted at the you know initially because the obviously the priority should be to help the uh, U European citizens firstly EU citizens mm -hmm. sorry firstly uh, mm -hmm. but then uh, when the EU uh, indeed has these discussions about what sort of package uh, it should have uh, this the question of the neighborhood the stability of the neighborhood the resilience of the neighborhood which we have to recall was one of the key words of uh, the EU global strategy uh, in uh, the end of 2016. Uh, so uh, that is where the EU should should and be able to do more. And my two recommendations were, one of them I've already mentioned, were for the ECB to become more active with the swap arrangements, just like the Fed is, but this one with a focus on its own, on Europe's neighborhood. And the other one, which is actually a costless exercise, is, to, to, is for the EU to reallocate, this is a bit getting a bit technical, but the EU to reallocate its IMF held special drawing rights to, the, to its partner countries. This the EU can do. There's, there's a proposition to increase SDRs globally, but the US is blocking it because they, I think there's an argument there that this would disproportionately uh, benefit rich countries given that they have higher quotas, but at least the EU could reallocate some of these shares that would go a long way in alleviating the uh, the economic burden in this neighborhood. Thank you very much, Sinan. Now we have five minutes and I do have a few more questions. So I'm gonna give you just a minute each to respond to them. Starting from Dimitri, um, there's a question from Burak uh, Cheliktenche. Could Turkey and Russia establish a different um, relationship in uh, Libya? And um, another question, for everyone, but I guess perhaps more for Mark and Sinan, is would the EU and Turkey cooperate in case of, of a massive COVID-19 outbreak in Syria, and I assume meaning the refugee population, um, which is likely to create another, yes, I I immigration influx. Um, and so uh, if you could tackle this, we'll start from Dimitri on the Russia-Turkey uh, relationship. And if I may just add in, because at the end of the article, Mark, that you published yesterday with Carnegie, you mentioned that maybe the goal of Turkey is actually to have permanent disorder um, rather than try and find a you know, solution in the various conflicts it's got itself involved in. And I think I could extend this question also to Dimitri about what, what the actual goals are um, in Libya. Dimitri, please. Well, I think that the Russian goal in Libya is uh, to be a part to uh, the eventual solution to the Libyan issue, to the Libyan problem. Uh, Libya is a very different case from Syria. Uh, Russia is, uh, is in contact with both sides. And uh, the uh, coalitions that uh, have emerged in Syria, the multinational coalitions supporting uh, the rival uh, forces in Syria are uh, very strange uh, geopolitical formations. So there is uh, no clear uh, leadership by any one country. There is no claim to be, uh, you know, the, uh, the maker of a future uh, Libya raised by any country, least of all Russia. So uh, absolutely, I think that Putin and Erdogan talked about Libya. Uh, they, uh, I don't think that they agreed, but uh, certainly there is, a, uh, there is a way for Russia and Turkey to find uh, uh, some sort of a, uh, of a common ground and, um, uh, and advance toward a, a solution that would be uh, acceptable to uh, the parties in Syria, excuse me, in Libya, and that would have international backing. Russia is also talking to European countries that uh, tend to have different views in Libya, such as France and Italy. So it's, uh, it's, it's a very fragmented situation, but also uh, this fragmentation gives one hope that uh, some sort of a, of a compromise solution could be reached. And let me just say finally that uh, uh, with regard to how Russia sees Turkey, Russia respects Turkey as it would respect any country that would have the temerity to say so, to say no to the United States. This is a golden uh, rule, golden standard of uh, sovereignty and independence as seen from Moscow and Turkey passes the test. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Uh, Mark, I'll pass it over to you. Um, yeah. yeah. Very quickly, I suppose. Yes. Um, well, uh, about helping uh, Syria refugees in Syria uh, on the pandemic, yes, of course, uh, the EU is, is always uh, ready uh, to provide humanitarian assistance. In the case of uh, refugees, we, we're basically talking of the Idlib province, which uh, can be accessed easily uh, through Turkey's uh, Hatay province. Uh, the only, uh, I mean, technically it's easy to do, it's uh, almost instant. Uh, but the issue is uh, politically, uh, whatever has been done for the millions of Syrians in Turkey or those still in Syria uh, has only earned uh, praise for the EU at technical level and massive uh, uh, criticism at the top political level. So the, the, the hesitation, if any, is, is there. Now, on the more general question of permanent disorder and so on. Well, as I have uh, written a couple of days ago, theoretically, at least in the post-Cold War order, you can argue that Turkey is strong enough economically, is becoming strong enough militarily to be the power in the middle, to be dealing on equal footing with the EU and the US and NATO and, and Russia on the other side. That's all fine, except a couple of things. One is that uh, the transatlantic alliance, at least until now, is a defensive pact. So you're within or you're out. Uh, that, that's one thing. So it's very difficult to, to make it uh, compatible. Uh, but certainly the current hesitations in Turkey's foreign policy, security policy that we see now are linked to this reasoning. Uh, Turkey doesn't need uh, at least that's what I read. Turkey doesn't need to belong exclusively anymore to the North Atlantic Alliance and, and could have uh, a different type of relationship. That's perhaps fine. Uh, and at least theoretically or academically, you can defend that point of view, except that uh, there are some incompatibilities in the existing treaties and you have to resolve that through discussion, dialogue, negotiation, and that's not what you have. So that's why I see in the very short term, or perhaps in the next three years, um, permanent tension as the preferred option, because at least you don't have to choose. Thank you very much. Uh, Sinan, you have the last word. Um, and yeah. also remember the sort of question about Turkey and the EU cooperating. Um, yeah. Well, let me be, um, you know, the, um, uh, in a way, a, a warning, uh, use my, you know, uh, a few seconds uh, for that, because there were a few questions about the refugee. And right now, many of the policy issues, including the refugee issue, uh, ha have been frozen because the, you know, the political capital is spent elsewhere. It's about managing the health crisis. But I'm afraid that once the acute phase of this health crisis is over, we're gonna go back uh, to many of those issues and the refugee issue will come back with a vengeance. What I mean by that is that, you know, for long, uh, Turkey has been, uh, has hosted about 4 million Syrian refugees and, uh, you know, remarkably well uh, on the economically and politically. So it hasn't really been uh, much of a political uh, discussion in Turkey about the fate of those refugees. But those were the times when the economy were, was doing well, when you know, the economy was growing, people were feeling that they were getting uh, you know, more affluence and so on. Now I'm afraid that you know, combined with the economic shock triggered by the, by the pandemic, the refugee issue will become much more a burning and toxic issue in Turkey politically, not only economically, economically as well, but also politically, because the Turkish people will want the government to help them firstly. And when they see all this aid being channeled to the refugees, uh, they are going to start asking you know, even more acute you know, questions to the leadership. So I think this is an area which the EU needs to be aware of. And if there is going to be uh, going forward you know, uh, some uh, new outlook towards what the EU should do on this, 
uh, this is the new political context uh, that will unfortunately make the management of the refugee issue more difficult at home in Turkey and, and therefore by extension uh, in, in the relations between Turkey and the EU. Thank you very much, Sinan. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Dimitri, for joining us from, from Moscow. Um, it's been a really great discussion. We've looked into all sorts of aspects of this complicated and fast moving chessboard that uh, Turkey is playing on. And um, I hope you all appreciated it. It will be possible to uh, visualize it again through the Carnegie Europe uh, website. So for those who have missed it, there'll be other opportunities. I'd like to thank all those who have tuned in. I'd like to thank our speakers. I'd like to thank those who've asked questions. And let me also thank my colleagues whom you can't see, but behind the scenes, they have been uh, working to make sure that this event uh, would take place so smoothly. So thank you very much. And um, we'll see you at our next webinar. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.